And listen, let me tell you something. Every good soldier, every good leader, every good general or colonel will know he's not going to win every battle. If he does, he knows he's been quite blessed and quite fortunate. But he wants to win the majority of those battles and win the war. Amen? And that's something that we can do in Jesus' name. Amen? We can win. Hallelujah. All right. Well, we got a lot of stuff to cover this morning. Um, really, I got tons of stuff for two weeks, really. Um, but this is something that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the day of wrath, the marriage supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the millennial reign, the beginning of that. Um, but first, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 this morning because I got to introduce this with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I've never seen a time where people have so much Bible knowledge yet know nothing. Truly, we live in a time when people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is a blindness and a veil on many, many Christians today. They cannot see simple, basic things that are in the Scriptures as plain as the nose on your face, and yet they cannot see it. And I want to read this before we get into this because I'm just telling you, what I'm going to share with you this morning is as plain as the nose on your face when it comes to the Scriptures. But I was thinking about that. I was thinking, Lord, how is it that so many born-again Christians, how is it that so many Bible school-trained pastors and ministers cannot seem to see what is clearly written in the book concerning whatever subject it may be? I'm really blown away. And then the Lord had to remind me this morning that the blind, he said, the blind will lead the blind. And when he said that, he was speaking to people who knew the Scriptures, but yet still could not see what he was saying and didn't really understand. They thought they understood, but they didn't fully understand what the Scriptures were saying. And so they didn't recognize the Messiah. They knew all the prophecies about the Messiah, but they didn't recognize the Messiah when he was standing before them. Folks, I'm telling you, there is a blindness that can come on you, that can come on Christians who will not listen. You know, a lot of people like to quote, what is it, Amos 9, I believe it is. But it's in Amos, I'll have to look it up in a second. But it says, a lot of people say there will come in the last days a famine of the Word of God. Or, and I've got to tell you, that's not what it says. It says there will come a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. Hearing, understanding it, and acting upon it. Listen, there's no famine of the Word of God. God said heaven and earth will pass away. His words will not pass away. He said, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, meaning the church will always exist. There will always be true apostles, true prophets, true evangelists, true pastors, true teachers, and true believers. Satan will never be able to wipe us off the face of the earth. He will try. He's tried many times. But he will never succeed fully. Amen? So there's always truth. There's always preachers and teachers of truth. The issue is, are you able to hear it? Are you able to discern who is telling you the truth of Scripture, of God Almighty, of the Lord Jesus, and who is not? That's really what it comes down to. And Jesus warned in the last days, many false prophets will rise. Many will come in my name saying, I am anointed and deceive many. And the only way that you can know that you're not being deceived is you have to know the Scriptures... And you have to have and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because there's some people that are deceived. Let me read this to you. Deceived, man. And this week, I had two very, very long discussions on Facebook. One guy I had to ban, he's a pastor, a minister. I had to ban him from my site. And then he starts sending me emails. I said, dude, I told you to move on. 
right? I said, now you've gone from being an annoyance to being a creepy cyber stalker. Move on. We're done, right? But he thinks he sees, and he doesn't see. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. There's so much of this, I don't want to try to read the whole thing here. But, oh, let's just start at verse 1. He says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some other epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Paul said to the Corinthian church, he said, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, uh, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, and he's talking about if the law, the written law given, he said, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glory? So basically he's saying there's more glory. If there was glory upon the old covenant, and, and such glory upon the law that Moses' face was glowing, and he had to put a veil over his face, and the children of Israel couldn't even bear to look at him. He's saying if that kind of glory was on the law, what's supposed to be uh, on the New Testament of grace and mercy and the blood of Jesus and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his resurrection? We should have more glory upon us. We should have more understanding, more revelation, more intimacy with God. We should understand and be able to hear what he's saying. Amen? But he speaks this. He goes on to say, let's, let's just look at verse 10. He says, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the gl glory that excelleth. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more than that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, and he's talking about in this new covenant, in this whole thing that Jesus has promised us, that he's paid for through the cross and his resurrection, he says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that is the heart, when it turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. He's saying here that because they could, would not receive what God was saying, it says a blindness or a veil came upon the Jewish people because they rejected certain aspects of God's truth. I'm going to tell you right now, you want me to give you the number one reason there is such blindness, and a veil upon the hearts of so many Christians because there's certain truths in the Bible they just refuse to accept and see. And, according to John 17, he, Jesus said, if any will do his will, he will know of the doctrine. So if you won't do the will of God, you're not going to understand the doctrine of God. Amen? That's just the way it is. There's a veil on people. I, I'm, I'm just mind, it, just, it just boggles my mind. Because there's things that aren't complicated in the Bible, and yet we've got theologians who complicate everything. And I, I, I just stand in awe at the crap they have to make up to make their doctrines work. But what's more mind-blowing is how many people believe their nonsense. There's been such an indoctrination in America of false doctrine, false teaching, that's learned to throw a few scriptures in here and there, and people believe it. It's really terrible. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, like the other day, I put this post up. 
I said I was talking about the pre-trib rapture error, the false doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture. It is false, and it's, it's so easy to see. And I said, there are going to be some pre-tribulation rapture Christians are going to have a full nervous breakdown when they find themselves in the great tribulation and facing the mark of the beast. And I said, what's amazing about them is they can't, is they're, they're so crazy about this doctrine, a lot of them, not all, but they're so crazy about this doctrine, it's like they can't live if you don't agree with them. That's what this pastor stalker was doing to me. He, just, he, I, he was trying to force me to agree with him. And he was condescending and arrogant, and he hadn't been saved or preaching or teaching or studying not half the time I have. And I'm just sitting here, dude, I, 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 I've explained it to you, and you want to keep pumping your agenda. Goodbye. Bye-bye now. Move on. I'm not arguing with you anymore. Titus says, a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. I'm not going to keep arguing with you. I'm going to give you the truth. You want to keep arguing? Go somewhere else and argue. I'm not arguing with you anymore. All right? I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to spell it out. Line upon line, precept upon precept. I'm going to make it clear, crystal clear. And then if you don't want to hear it, guess what? It's on you at that point on. Here's the problem, though. Whenever you are presented with scriptural Bible truth and you reject it, you are headed down the road to deception. There was some famous philosopher that said there's two ways to be deceived. One is to believe a lie, and the other is to refuse to believe the truth. All right? God's word is truth, right? We don't build things on assumptions. Now, I want everybody to go with me to Revelation 6. Because there's been some of you that's had questions about the marriage supper of the Lamb. When does that happen? The millennial reign? But we need to address this. Because we start talking about there is no pre-tribulation rapture. The Bible does not teach that. never has taught that. It couldn't be more clear as the nose on your face. Jesus gave us an outline in Matthew 24. Listen, folks, the outline in Matthew 24, Jesus said, they asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world, the end of the age? And Jesus was playing. He said, well, take heed that no man deceive you. So the first thing he says, don't be deceived. People will come in my name and trying to deceive you. Then he said, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and great earthquakes in diverse places and famines. And he said, these are the beginning of sorrows, or the beginning of the birth pains, right? How many of you ladies know when the birth pains begin, the baby's coming, right? So he said, these are the beginning of sorrows. Use the word then. Then this will happen. Then this. Then this. Then this. Then is used over and over in Matthew 24. Then means after this, right? So it's simple to understand that Matthew 24 is a sequential outline, right? Sequential outline in order. Now, Jesus goes on down and he says in Matthew 24, they will deliver you up to be afflicted. They will kill you. You will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, verse 15 is the midpoint of the last seven years. It is when the Antichrist steps into the rebuilt Jewish temple and declares himself to be God, takes control there. That is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Verse 15 of Matthew 24 is that event. And that lets us know that verse 15 is halfway through the last seven years. Yet, verse 1 to 15, no mention of the saints being raptured, the church being raptured and taken up. Right? So then he goes on, verse 21, and he says, Then shall be great tribulation, such was never has been since there was a nation to this time, nor ever shall be. Then he says, False Christ 
and false prophets will arise and do great signs and wonders. And so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And according to Revelation 13, we know when the Antichrist and the false prophets start doing signs and wonders, it's right after the midpoint, which is right. It all flows together, right? Still no mention from verse 21, verse 24 in Isaiah 20. No mention of the, one of the biggest events of the end times, and that is the resurrection of the righteous dead, what we call the rapture, which word is not in the Bible. I only do that so these people that have been indoctrinated by bad theology will understand. The rapture is the resurrection of the righteous dead, and we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will be changed from, immor from mortal to immortal in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what I'm talking It is a resurrection. Everybody say this with me. The rapture, the rapture is, a is a resurrection from the dead. From the dead. It's not a moment of ecstasy. Right? <laughs> That's really what that word means. You know that? Where we get this mess from rapture. All right? Resurrection. First resurrection. Oh, and by the way, for those of you listening out there, there's not 15 resurrections. Two. One of the righteous, one of the wicked. All right? There's not three, there's not four, there's not five, there's not six. Perry Stone, anybody else listening? If you believe a pre-tribulation rapture, you've got to come up with about three or four. The Bible teaches two resurrections from the dead. One happens at the second coming of Jesus for those who are believers, who are living for God. And if you were, you were a believer and you were living for God and walking with Jesus and ready to go, if you died, your body goes in the grave, your spirit, your soul immediately is in heaven. But at the coming of Jesus, if you're a dead saint, your body's going to rise up and be changed from that mortal, uh, corruptible body to an Im Im immortal body like Jesus, a body that's going to live forever, and your spirit and soul will be united with that body. That's the rapture. That happens at the second coming of Jesus at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Then 1,000 years later is the second resurrection, and that is the wicked dead that will come out of hell and will stand before God to give an account of everything that they've done. It's kind of like when you get arrested. Anybody in here been arrested? <laughs> <laughs> no, only a few were quick to raise their hand. Well, let me explain it to you. Sometimes if you, you know, some of us were not so good beforehand, all right, before we followed Jesus, all right? And you get caught, you get arrested, right? And you get put in jail. And then you get bail, right? Or maybe you're in jail, but you haven't been to court yet. So you have people who died wicked, not ready, not walking with Jesus, not living in righteousness and holiness and obedience. Those people went to hell. You go to heaven or you go to hell immediately upon death. There's none of this soul sleep crap that's being taught now. Okay? Your body goes in the grave to sleep, but your spirit and soul is very much alive. And to be absent from the body, the Bible says to be present with the Lord. If you're a believer, you're true walking with God. But also, when the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16, the moment they died, it said the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Bring me a drop of water. I am tormented by this flame. He was very much aware that he was in hell. But the body goes in the grave. Well, if you are righteous at the second coming of Jesus, the resurrection that we call the rapture is going to happen. And you will stand before God in a moment, tweaking that, in a millisecond. But a thousand years later, the wicked dead, the unsaved, the rebellious, the disobedient, they will be raised up. Their day in court. The books will be open and the videotapes will be played. And death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay, there's only two. Jesus spoke of there's two resurrections in John chapter 5. Two, only two. Jesus said the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the righteous, the believers. And he said unto life, and that there's the resurrection of the wicked unto eternal damnation. That's it. There's only two mass resurrections taught in the Bible about the end. That's it. It's not complicated. It's this resurrection, these two resurrections are taught in Daniel chapter 12. They're taught in Revelation 20 as plain as the nose is on your face. It's not hard. 
It's not hidden in mystical, symbolic language. It's really not. But then we have these people that want to tell us, well, wait a minute, now you say we're going to go through this thing. Oh, I didn't finish my Matthew 24. Yeah, we're going to go through it. We're going to go all the way through it. Now, I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again and make it plain. Remember we were at Matthew 24 a minute ago? We got to verse 24. 21, great tribulation. We're already Antichrist in the abomination of desolation. No rapture mentioned. Right? We see the false Christ and the false prophets rise and doing miracles. Right? You can put it up there if you want. Matthew 24, verse 24. He says, then, lo, if anyone say, here is Christ is there, believe it not. For as lightning shining from the east is to the west, and we're going to talk about that next week, when he splits the skies, when he rolls them back like a scroll. There's nothing up there. How does he, why does he have to split them and roll them back like a scroll? We'll talk about that, okay? If it's just vapor. I got some stuff for y'all next week, for sure. But here we go. No mention of the rapture. Jesus giving a sequential outline of the last days. No mention of the rapture. And then we get to this pesky little verse that just drives the preacher of rapture people nuts. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. What does this say right here? What's that word? After. Everybody say it loud. I can't hear you. After. Say it for the camera. Say it for Facebook Live. Let me hear you. After. After what? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Before? Doesn't that say before? Kevin, in the Greek, does it say before? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The sky itself will be shaken. Deal with that. Let's go on. The dome will come down. Let's go on. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, in heaven, in the sky. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power. It's not secret. Everybody's going to see when he splits the sky open. Everybody's going to see. Nothing secret about this next event. It says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There is the rapture or the resurrection of the church at the second coming of Jesus immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now here's what the psychos out there want to say. They, they, where they have to pull this stuff out of their butt. Okay? I'm sorry, but this is where it's coming from. Well, wait a minute. They'll say, well, Matthew 24 is only for the Jews. Where do you get that? Does it say that in the anywhere in the entire chapter? No. His elect, when it says they will gather his elect, every time elect is used, the word, almost every time it's used for the church of Jesus Christ, the Christians, the believers, not the Jews. In fact, the other times it's used, one time Jesus is called the elect, precious, cornerstone, right? And another time it's used talking about the elect angels. Other than that, everybody say this with me. We are the elect. <laughs> First Thessalonians, I love how people want to, they, they pull up First Thessalonians chapter 4. They pull up first, as a, you know, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, right? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And they, they'll quote that verse to me, and they'll go, see, it's a pre-tribulation rapture. Where does it say that in that passage? 
You can quote that passage to me all day long. Yes, it's about the resurrection of the righteous or, and the rapture, as you call it. But does it say when it happens in the last seven-year period? No, it doesn't. So that's not a proof text. Right? But he does give us some clues there in 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord will descend from heaven, from the sky, in the clouds, in our atmosphere, with the sound of a trumpet, with angels. Same thing Matthew 24 says. The Lord will send his angels, the sound of a trumpet, that will gather the elect as they see the sky open and Jesus beginning to descend. This is when the rapture happens. At the end. Now, I just we just read this in Matthew 24, right? Matthew 24. What did he say? Sun and moon go dark. Stars fall. That means the stars aren't like the size of our sun. So the stars fall. Sun and moon go dark. All right, I want everybody to turn with me now to Revelation 6. And Kevin, you can put up the picture, if you would. Now, I want you to see something here. It took me a lot of years of studying to figure all this out. Let me explain this. Let's read Revelation 6 real quick because I want to read the sixth seal. There a lot of people think that the, six, the, the seven seals are going to happen, then the seven trumpets are going to happen, and then the seven vials of wrath are going to happen. That's what most people believe about Revelation. That's not the way it works. And if you don't listen to this, if you don't get this, it's just because you're going to be stubborn. Okay? Or the indoctrination of your denomination or whatever, your church you went to or grew up in or or Paul Paul taught you, whatever, right? Paul Paul wasn't right about everything, okay? He might have been a good fellow, but it doesn't mean he's right about everything. Bible's right, only the Bible. Now let's look at this. The sixth seal is this same event in Matthew 24. I'm, I, pl- I promise you I'm going somewhere. I know this is, for, for our group, this is review, Okay, But let me tell you this, if you can't explain it to somebody, then you don't know it well enough yet. <laughs> right? If you can't share it with somebody else, then you hadn't learned it well enough. All right? So let's go. Look at the sixth seal. Go down to Revelation 6, verse 12. See, I believe we're in the fifth seal right now. It's already happening. That's the martyrdom. The first wave of end-time martyrdom. Okay? We're seeing that with ISIS and what's happened in the Middle East. The sixth seal, though, he says, verse 12, And I and beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. This is not happening three or four times. This is the same event. He says, The stars fall. Uh, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Every mountain and island. Remember that. This is one day. One day. Let, let me just explain to you. How many of you know, you ever say, I've had a long day? You ever had a long day where a lot of stuff happened all day long? It's like you got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and it's 2 o'clock the next morning. You can say, I had a long day, right? Let me tell you something. The, the final day, the great day of God's wrath, it is a day. It is one day. Everybody say, one day. This is one day, right? That's why it's called the day of the Lord, not the week of the Lord, not the year of the Lord. The final day of God's wrath, the great day of his wrath. Let's keep reading here. It's when the heavens departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, 
and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Matthew 24 is the second coming of Jesus. It is when the sun goes dark and the moon does not give it light and the stars fall. It is the sixth seal, is the second coming. So if the sixth seal is the second coming of Jesus, and then the kings of the earth see him coming and want to hide from him, it is the second coming. How do you have the six seals, the seven seals happen, then seven trumpets, then it doesn't make any sense. And God wrote the book of Revelation. He had John write it in a way as to confuse people who want to stay stupid. Okay? God wrote the book sometime, and he, the way he did it this is why it says it has to be rightly divided. You have to study and you have to make it. You have to, it's like a puzzle God gave us that's all scrambled up. But if you pay attention and you're diligent and you look, and yes, you might get somebody to help you, but you can put that puzzle together. It's called, that's why it's called rightly dividing, putting the pieces together. Okay? That's what we just did, Matthew 24, Revelation 6. These are two pieces of the puzzle that go together. Okay, so what this tells you, what this shows you, let's go to the picture, and I'm going to show you this, that the seals, the seven seals of Revelation are the long story, but they end at the second coming of Jesus, okay? The seven trumpets are a shorter story. They didn't start at the same time as the seals, but they are end at the second coming of Jesus. The vials of wrath are the even shorter. These all happened in the last three and a half years of the tribulation. They didn't start at the same time as these others, but they all end. So they don't start at the same time, but they end at the same time. So what, what is that? If you've got three stories, that show you something starts. The seals are one story of the end days and the second coming of Jesus. The trumpets are another story. And the seven vials are another story. They didn't all start at the same time. But they all end at the same time. So I just showed you the sixth seal is the second coming of Jesus. It is the end. Right? Right? What happens? What is the seventh seal? I love it. You know what the seventh seal is? 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Why is there silence? 30 minutes of silence. Because everybody's in shock at God's wrath that's coming down. Because the earth will shake and reel to and fro like a drunkard. Every mountain will collapse. Every island will be moved. All the cities of the nations will be brought to ruins in one day. The great day of God's wrath. Now, I can prove this. Let me show you. Now, I believe that these seals started immediately after Jesus died and rose again in the first century, and they've been working, and we're on the fifth seal, the sixth seal, the second coming, seventh is silence. The seven trumpets, I believe, started in 1914. I got proof of that. We're not teaching that today. But bring us to the second coming. These right here, the, the, the vials of wrath, they are the last three and a half years. What's interesting, everybody thinks, well, this, this, is, the big, this is the big argument from the pre-tribbers and mid-tribbers and pre-rathers and everybody else. God's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. Preach it, brother. Not it didn't say rapture. Exactly. Salvation. Exactly. They love, see, words are important. Exact words are important. You're correct. But here's the thing. What they miss is what is God's wrath? What they miss is this is man doing this. The Antichrist deception. That's Satan. Communism. War. This is man's wrath. God didn't say he would deliver us from man's wrath or persecution or tribulation. In fact, he said we would go through tribulation and persecution, didn't he? I love these pre you know, I love the verse in uh, 
John 17, when it says, Jesus said, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from evil. Huh. I guess the pre-tribbers must believe that the Father's not going to answer Jesus' prayer there. You don't take them out of the world, you protect them. Right? Anyway, let's look at it. But, oh, I will say this. Look at this. The first, the first vial of wrath, is that on believers? No, what does it say? Sores on those who, so people with the mark of the beast break out in, in terrible sores. Is that for me or you? No. The sea turned to blood, sea life dies, is that affecting me or you? Nope. Rivers and fountains turned to blood? Let me ask you something. When the fountains and the rivers in Egypt turned to blood, were the children of Israel okay? Scorched by the sun? Who's that for? Those blaspheming God, because they'll start blaspheming God when they're scorched by the sun. Darkness is on the seat of the throne of the beast. Does that have anything to do with us? That'll be where his headquarters is. And the Euphrates River drives up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Does that have anything to do with us? You see, all these doctrines of men are built on assumptions and foolishness. Right? Now let's look at it. I want to show you. We just read the sixth and seventh seal. Let's look at the sixth and seventh trumpet. Okay? Remember, they end at the same time. So go to Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to try to get through this. I know I'm trying hard. Revelation 10. Let's look at it. Now we've moved to the seven, the six and seven trumpets. Now the sixth trumpet is going to be the war that's coming. I believe the fifth trumpet's already happened. Again, I've already covered that. The next trumpet to be blown will be the sixth trumpet war. The seventh trumpet is the end. It is the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection. Let's look at it. That's the last trumpet when Paul's talking about when we are changed. So let's look at it. Revelation 10 verse. We're going to drop down here. And let's see. Verse 7. He says this, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel... When he shall begin to sound, it says this, The mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. Everybody say this, When the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is finished. It's the end. That is the last trump. Paul said at the last trump, we shall be changed. When's the last trumpet happen? Let's look at it. Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded. Here's the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So at the seventh trumpet, he says, that is when Jesus takes possession of the world, the earth, again, full possession. That means he's here, baby. Right? Now let's see what he says. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come. When is thy wrath come? Right here at this seventh trumpet. When did it come with the seals? At the sixth seal, at the end, the sixth, sixth and seventh seal. The wrath has come, and the nations were angry. And notice what he says. At the seventh trumpet, he says, is also the time of the dead. Come on now. The time of the dead. What does that mean? It's the time that the righteous dead will be raised up. The resurrection, the rapture. At the last trumpet. Amen? So he tells you again here, it's the time of the dead that they should be judged and thou just shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. Do you see how the sixth and seventh seal and the sixth, the, the, the seventh trumpet are the same event? Right? Now let me show you that also the sixth and the seventh vials are the end. 
in the second coming of Jesus. Let's go to Revelation 16. I'm booking, trying to do it. Revelation 16, this is vitally important. Y'all don't know how many people I find that are confused about this or ask about this. I don't mind people to say I don't know and ask questions. I don't like people who are arrogant and think they know everything and want to try to tell me how it is. No, you don't know. If you're going to come with that pre-trib rapture crap, you don't know. You think you know. You're like the Pharisees. You think you know, but you don't know. You have a veil upon your heart, blindness. You're going to have a nervous breakdown when it, when it gets down to it. Revelation 16. Now we're going to read about the sixth and the seventh vial of wrath. Pay attention. All this right here has just been warm up for where we're going. All right? Here we go. Verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The dragon is the devil, the beast is the antichrist, and the false prophet will be the final pope. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world, and gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then Jesus says this in the midst of this. Behold, I come as a thief. <laughs> Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place in the Hebrew, called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Everybody say the sixth seal, I mean the sixth vial of wrath, is when the demon spirits gather the kings of the earth to the battle of Armageddon. That's what it is. Now look at what happens at the seventh. The seventh vial of wrath. Remember what happened at the sixth seal? Stars fell, earthquake, right? Right? Every, every island and mountain moved. Remember that? Yeah. Revelation 6. Look at this. The seventh angel pours out his vial. Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Remember a minute ago, the seventh trumpet, he says the mystery of God is finished. At the seventh trump, at the seventh vial of wrath, he says it is done. It's the same event. The same moment. Hear what he says. He says it is done. Verse 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city, that is Jerusalem, was divided into three parts. And look at this. And the cities of the nations fell. The cities of the nations, the big cities, all fall. And great Babylon, which is Rome, came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And look at verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. This is proof that the seventh vial of wrath is the same as the sixth seal. It is the same event. It is the same as the seventh trumpet. It's the same event. Okay? And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So this is the end. This is Armageddon. Right as God, the, the sixth vial is poured out, and the demon spirits go out of the mouth of the false prophet and the beast and the dragon, and they gather the kings of the earth to the valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Armageddon, for the battle to fight Jesus. They know. See, let me tell you something. Some events have already taken. They know Jesus. It's the day. They know it's the day. They gather the armies to battle. And while this is happening, there's a lot of things going on. Jesus is going to have a long day that day. But thank God he doesn't get tired. Amen? His second... Listen, listen to me, everybody. His second coming, that day is going to be a great day of many events that happen. 
He's going to visit certain places. It says he's going to go to Edom and kill the Antichrist. And everybody who followed him in the land of Jordan, actually. That's what it says in the book. Very clear. Right here. All right. Now, let me say this. So we've got every island, every mountain. Now, remember, what's interesting is the judgment here, he says, of Mystery Babylon, which is Rome and the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. He says, happens at this seventh vial of wrath or at the end. Everybody say this with me. Mystery Babylon, Babylon. destroyed Destroyed. at the end. end. It is Rome. Now, Revelation 17 and 18 is what we call a parenthetical statement. You can put Revelation 17 and 18 in a big old parenthesis, right? Because what they do is identify for you Mystery Babylon. There's no question that gives all the clues who Mystery Babylon would be. It is the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, and her daughters. Okay? Now, the great city of Rome will be destroyed at the very end by the beast. But we're going to skip Revelation 17 and 18 because I've already taught on that. But Revelation 16 picks up in Revelation 19. Right, if you write a sentence and you put something in parentheses, but your sentence continues, you understand what I'm saying? Revelation 16, parentheses, 17, 18, and then go to 19. 19 tells us this. Go to Revelation 19. I love this because Revelation 19 talks about, you know, the end of Revelation 17 is about the judgment of mystery Babylon, the Rome. Rome. And look at verse, Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore. Now, the great whore is mystery Babylon, Rome, Vatican. He's judged. Now, so Revelation 19 lets you know exactly when, where he is, right? Because when did the mystery Babylon get judged? What? The seventh vial of wrath, which is at the end of the last seven years, right? Everybody see that? Remember, didn't we just read that? So we know the timing of the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Rome, the seventh vial. Revelation 19 picks up and says, you have judged, at this point, you have judged the great whore, Mystery Babylon, which did corrupt the earth. So he's saying, what follows this seventh vial of wrath, what follows the destruction of Mystery Babylon, look at what it says. This is when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. How do I know that? Because it says it. Not seven years before. He says right here, For true and righteous, look at verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and his smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God, that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise God. He said, Praise our God, all ye his servants. Now this is very interesting. Everybody mark this verse. Praise him, all ye his servants. And hmm, those who fear him. We'll talk about that in a second. Both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. After the judgment of Mystery Babylon, after the tribulation, is when the marriage comes, the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says, then, what? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife, the bride of Christ, the church, has made herself ready. Not before this. Not before. And I don't know what this is doing Everybody see that? 
The marriage of the Lamb has come after the judgment of the great whore mystery Babylon, which happens at the seventh vial of wrath, which happens at the end of the last seven years. The marriage supper of the Lamb is not seven years before. There is no pre-tribulation rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb. All that Jewish tradition crap. You can't make doctrine, Bible doctrine, out of Jewish traditions. The Bible even tells us we're not supposed to do that. I'm sorry, but the whole thing of the Jewish wedding tradition is not Bible. I've heard that stuff for 30 years. Show me it's scripture. It ain't there. Right? Now, Jesus comes. Let's look at this. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him for the marriage of the Lamb has come at the end. After the judgment of the great whore, after the seventh file of wrath, after the seventh trumpet, when we're all changed, that's when we go up. See, folks, let me, let me explain something to you. Let me give you a verse here. Notice it says this in Luke 17. It says this. The same day. Everybody say this with me. The same day, the same day. that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all. The same day. When is the great day of God's wrath? At the very end, at the seventh vial, at the seventh trumpet, at the sixth seal and the seventh seal. It's at the end. The great day of his wrath is that last day. And it says the same day of his great wrath is the day we go out. Not before. Not three and a half years before. Not a year before. Not seven years before. That's why Jesus said in John 6, in John 6, Jesus said it three times about the righteous who believe in him and follow him. He said, I will raise him up at the last day. Plain is the nose on your face. But we got it seven years before the last day, most of the church. When he raises up the righteous Christians, right? Now, we having fun yet? I got to hurry. Unless, of course, we don't have to get out by 12, right? <laughs> All right. Let's keep reading this. So, verse 7 again. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb. Jesus Christ has come and his wife, the bride, the church, has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, To see that thou do it not on thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now notice what he says here. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. So let me, let me explain this real quick. The day of the great day of God's wrath is going to start out something like this. First, Jesus is going to split the skies open. He's going to roll it back. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the angels are going to go forth. And they're going to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. As that happens in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, same day, as that event takes place, the same day we go out, the day of his wrath begins. And that is when all the nations will begin to fall. That's when all the islands will be moved. That's when all the mountains will be brought down to the ground. That's when the hailstones will begin to fall out of heaven. Upon the earth. That is the great day of God's wrath. The sun will go dark. The moon will not give off. The stars will fall. That is one day. You hear me? And that day will happen. And we will be in heaven. And that's going to be raining down upon the earth. Right? And that's going to be Jesus is going to be with us taking a little break. We're going to have a little, a little dinner. We're going to sit down and have the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And while all this is going on, the 30 minutes of silence, we'll all be silent because we'll be struck because we will see what is happening upon the earth. And we'll be struck with awe and silence. And after that 30 minutes of silence, then we'll begin to rejoice. And we're going to have this great marriage supper with the Lord Jesus. And we're going to enjoy a nice dinner while all hell and heaven's wrath is raining down upon the earth. And when we finish dinner, the Lord will stand up and say, let's go. And he's going to roll the sky back again. And this time on a horse. And we'll be riding behind him with our white robes. Same day, people. The same day. And we'll be riding with him. And it says that he is going to destroy those who have destroyed the earth. He's going to destroy those who followed the beast, who took the mark of the beast, who worshipped the beast in his image. He's going to kill and destroy all those wicked sinners. But let me say this. This is what most people don't understand. Not everyone who goes through the tribulation who is not born again will take the mark or worship the beast. There will be people who survive the tribulation period who were not born again. Listen to me. But they were not evil. They did not mistreat Christians and Jews. And God's going to allow them, if they survive the tribulation, he's going to allow them to go into the millennial reign as mortals. So how do I know that? So we've been taught that only righteous people are going to go into the millennial reign. Where does it say that? Give me one verse of Scripture that says that. That only the righteous go into the millennial reign. No. If you were righteous in Christ Jesus, if you were born again and you were ready, walking with the Lord, and you're alive through the tribulation, you will be raptured, resurrected at the end. You will meet the Lord. You will be changed. You will have an immortal body like the Lord Jesus. So who's going into the tribulation period? Well, these people. Remember, the Bible says, and we can go back. Everybody, I've got so much here. Um, how many of you remember where it says, was it Revel, uh, Zechariah 13? When Jesus comes, it says the Jews, many of the Jews will walk up to him, right? Because he's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to begin to set up his kingdom. So many of the Jews will live and they're going to go, the Jews are going to go, where, where did you get these wounds? Meaning they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah before he's standing in front of them and they see his wounds and his hands and his feet and they say, where, where did you get these wounds? And he has to explain it to them. And it says there will be a great mourning among the Jews for their Messiah, really realizing that they helped crucify him and they rejected him and it brought all of this blindness and destruction upon them for so many years. But this goes along with what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and 11, that at the end, the remnant of Jews that survive all that, it says, will be saved. All of Israel will be saved. Meaning, God's going to let these Jews see him and believe on him, but they will go into the millennial reign as mortals. And guess what? Isaiah 66 Isaiah 6, the end of Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 talks about in the millennial reign, an infant will be considered, a person 100 years old will be considered an infant. And, they will, and people will die in the millennial reign. And people will sin in the millennial reign. He talks about the nations, and Zechariah talks about the nations who will be left after all this judgment. Let me, let me show you this. Everybody go to Matthew chapter 25. I feel the anointing all over this right here. Now, some people think, well, I'll just believe in Jesus when I see him. You may not get that opportunity. You don't know if you're going to survive the tribulation period, right? In fact, few will survive in comparison. World War III, the Sixth Trumpet War, it says it's going to kill one-third of mankind. So you better hope you're not in that one-third, right? 
But this is a beautiful story. Now, let me break it down for you. So I'm learning things. Right, let me tell you something about God. You, if, 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 I don't care how long you work, walk with him, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you're still going to be learning at the 50-year mark. You'll never, never end with learning new things about him. I preached on these passages many times, so let me break it down for you, and I'm going to do it quick. Matthew 25, there's three main teachings of Jesus. There's the parable of the ten virgins. There's the parable of the three servants with the talents, the money, not talent to play the piano. right? And the sheep and the goats. And we've misunderstood. A lot of people think that the sheep and the goats has to do with the judge, a judgment in heaven. It does not. Okay? Let me explain this. The ten virgins, and I've just got a whole new revelation on this, so y'all bear with me. Listen to me. So there's five wise and five foolish, right? Everybody knows the story. They're all virgins. And I've shared that only uh, Paul said that the church, the born-again believers, he called them, I, my job is to present, present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 1, 2, right? So you can't be considered a virgin, clean, pure, chaste, unless you've been born again and washed in the blood of Jesus, because that's the only thing that makes you clean, pure, chaste, right? So all ten were born-again Christians, right? Now, I've always assumed that the foolish went to hell. doesn't say that, though. does not say that. Uh-oh. That's what it says. The five wives had oil in their lamps with their vessels, right? But it says the foolish ran out of oil. Their lamps went out. Fire went out. But notice that all ten were alive to the coming of the Lord. Right? He comes. Five go with him. Five stay. And it says the five who stayed were knocking, Lord, let us in. No, you don't go into the way. I believe the foolish will be left here for the day of wrath. If they survive, they may go into the millennial reign. Maybe they fall on their knees and realize what they've done and lived a lukewarm Christian life, and they fall on their knees and repent. God will let them live through that day of wrath and make it into the millennial reign as a mortal. They may not survive. Let's just put it this way. You want to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? The next parable of the talents gives you three servants. See, the first one, the, the ten virgins, gives you a picture of the church, the born-again church. The next one gives you a picture, I believe, of the ministers of God. Notice it says about them, the ones who were given the different realms of authority and that should have produced fruit. I believe these are ministers of the gospel, pastors, gospel ministers. And what's interesting, 5, 2, 1, but it says the one who was not faithful, who did not do what his Lord wanted him to do, says he was cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it does say the ministers because we're held to a greater standard. Right? So the ministers who will not faithful will not make it. But the sheep and the goats has nothing to do with the church, has nothing to do with the ministers of the gospel. The sheep and the goats has to do with the nations that are left after the tribulation ends. Those who survive, who did not take the mark of the beast, who did not worship the beast, who did not go against Israel or the church, there will be nations, there will be people left. I mean, think about it. There's tribes all over the world who don't know anything about all this stuff. There's people all over the world. There's people all over the world who know about the chip, who know about the new world order, who know about the world government, saying they're not going to do it, but they're not born again Christians. They're not, they don't know the Lord. But they know the truth about what's happening. And they're like, you're not putting a chip in me. Sorry, but they're not saved. They don't know Jesus. I, mean, I know a lot of people like that. A lot of people claim to know Jesus, claim to be a Christian, but not born again. 
There's a lot of people, I think, and that are good moral people, but they're not saved. But let me tell you something about God. It does pay to be a good moral person, and it does pay not to treat the Jews and the Christians bad. I'm going to show you that. Because for the nations that survived the tribulation period, their judgment will be determined about how they treated Christians and Jews through the tribulation. Let's read this. Familiar passage everybody thinks they know. I thought I knew it too. Verse 31. See, he had already said, look at verse 30, about the minister, cast ye the unprofitable servant in the outer darkness, that should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, and when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, when the Son of Man come, everybody say that, when the Son of Man come, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So this is after the judgments. This is when Jesus sits, is seated upon his throne in Jerusalem, the real Jerusalem, the city of the great king. There will be a throne there. Jesus will sit there. The nations will be able to come and see him. They will see the nail prints in his hands and his feet. This is a real kingdom coming. A real king is returning. The real creator of heaven and earth is coming. And it says... When all the holy angels, he will sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Wait a minute. We've always assumed this was in heaven. No, when Jesus comes, his throne is set up upon the earth. The final judgment of the wicked, the great white throne, is a thousand years later. So what is this? This is the nations that survive. The people that survive the tribulation, that don't take the mark of the beast, that don't worship the beast, that don't come to fight against Jerusalem and Israel, that don't persecute Christians. They survive, well, maybe some of them. But these are people that survive, right? Let's go. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. It doesn't say they were sheep and the goats. He said as or like. Right? Verse 33, And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me, then shall the righteous answer him and said, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came to thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, what's interesting about this, and the reason God woke me up to this, is because... He says these people didn't realize that their good deeds and loving people and being good to people, they didn't realize it was for Jesus. I mean, we as Christians know when we do something for someone good or bless someone, we're doing it for the Lord. It's, it's him through us, right? They didn't understand that. You see what I'm saying? So it shows me that they weren't born-again believers understanding all of our Christian ease, right? I'm going to prove this. Notice he said, though, you've done it to my brethren. Now, who are Jesus' brethren? The church and the, Jew, and the Jews. So he said, because of how you've treated my brethren, I'm calling you righteous. Now, a lot of people, I had this lady arguing with me the other day. She goes, she goes, you can't, God didn't call anybody righteous that's not saved. Oh, but wait a minute. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. The Italian, centurion. It says that he prayed often. He feared God. It said he gave alms to the nation of Israel, to the Jews. But he was not born again. 
It says that he was a just man, a devout man. He was a good man. And he blessed the Jewish people. He didn't treat them badly as a Roman soldier. And it said, God said, he is, his, his deeds, his good deeds toward my people has come up to me as a memorial. And God gave him a vision of a man coming to him to tell him something. And God blessed him and sent Peter the apostle to preach to him. And that is when he was born again in his whole household. But he was called a devout man, a just man in that passage. And the word just in the Greek means righteous. See, let me tell you something. How you treat people, and especially how you treat Israel, the Jews, and the Christians, will determine a lot about you. That's why he said to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Right? Notice what he says to those on the left. Verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they say unto him, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, and sick, or in prison? and did not minister unto thee. And then he shall say unto them, Verily I say unto you, as much as you did unto one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Listen, there's going to be a reverse rapture. These are people living that are going to be put in hell alive. You say, has that ever happened in the Bible? Anybody remember Korah, the sons of Korah? Rebelled against Moses? Tried to reject Moses and Aaron? And it says, God opened the earth up and swallowed them. They went alive into hell. I call that the reverse rapture. All right? Listen. You have no guarantees about when you die. You don't know when that's going to be. If you're going to live through everything that's coming, if you're going to live through the tribulation to the second coming of Jesus, to the rapture, the resurrection of the dead, you might be one of those who live through it all. You may not be. I may be. I may not be. We don't know, which is why we must always be ready. Because we don't know. But folks, the king is going to return. Amen? And the great day of his wrath is approaching. And the sinners and the wicked are going to find themselves in a world of hurt. But God is merciful he doesn't want anyone to perish. And there's a lot of people that are going to have their eyes open in the days ahead. But folks, we know when the rapture is going to happen in the scheme of the last seven years. We know when the marriage supper of the Lamb happened. We know when the great day of His wrath happened. It's one day. And we know that many will go alive into the millennial reign as mortal human. And here's the good news. For those of us that were faithful in walking with Jesus through all of that, those who go in the rapture, those who are given the immortal bodies, when we return in those white robes with Him, the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Jesus on the earth for a thousand years and the book of Luke and other places shows us that some of us will rule five cities, some will rule ten cities. We will become the governors, the kings and priests of the Most High God. God is not done with us even when all of this changes. You understand? 
And I believe this. What you've studied now, what you've learned now, you're going to be teaching in that thousand-year period, that people. Because there's going to be another rebellion. Satan's going to be bound during that thousand years. But Revelation 20 says, at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be loose to go forth and to deceive the nations again. And there are going to be many people who lived in the millennial reign who saw Jesus with his hands and feet pierced, who saw the thousand years of peace, no war, that saw the blessings of God on the nations. And guess what? Even during that time, Jesus will curse nations who refuse to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. So even then, you're going to have rebels who decide to rebel against God even when they can see him face to face. And you say, oh, well, I would never do that. Oh, really? How many Christians... I know Christians who have been born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed in their bodies, had the power of God all over them. And I'll turn around and walk away back into sin. So don't tell me folks won't rebel when they see Jesus. Face. Yes, they will. Satan, could, Satan was before the throne of God. And he, when he decided to rebel, no, we'll have another rebellion at the end of those thousand years. That's God cleaning house one more time. And after that, it says fire will come down. The enemies, Satan will gather his little army and come against the saints. And God's just going to say, you know what? Here's how we're going to deal with this. Fire come down. Just destroy them all like that. And then that's over. That's it. No more. No more rebels, no more sinners, no more wicked. And then we begin a whole new chapter. And God says he'll create a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, there's so much more he has for us, folks. Yes, sir. Is for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promised for both the life that is now and of that which is to come. Does that tie in with what you're saying about us being prepared now, preparing now, and being used? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, what's amazing when it says we'll be known even as we are known, you know, when Jesus comes. And I think about that. Basically, <laughs> people will recognize you. You're not going to, you're not going to immediately be someone, you're not going to be someone else. You're going to be you. Now, granted, our minds are going to be open. Our understanding is going to be open greater. We'll be given the mind of Christ. But I, I really do believe that all of our, I, nothing, nothing done for the Lord here and now is going to be wasted. We will use it for all eternity. We will share our stories. We will share our testimonies. We will share the things the Lord taught us and he did for us. We will share those things for, through the whole millennial reign. We will share them with people for all eternity. I, I can't wait to sit down with some folks. I can't wait. I want to sit down and talk to King David. And Abraham. And Moses. They got, I said, hey, Moses, can we have lunch tomorrow? I'd love to chat about that whole sea dividing thing. And you know what he'll say? Can I talk to you? I would love to talk about that whole Antichrist thing. Tell me about that. Paul will walk up and go, you got to see what I was talking about. You got to see it. Tell me. I only knew by what God was having me right now, but tell me. Listen, we're all going to be stars, heroes. We'll all have our battle stories to share. Amen? Amen. Heaven's going to be great, y'all. The millennial reign here, we'll have a home in heaven. We'll be able to travel between the two places. There's, don't miss it. I, I got so disturbed last night and yesterday and driving here. I'm just thinking about people. Like we saw this guy on the, walking on the road. And he looked like he looked like he'd been doing some drugs, some hard drugs. 
someone right. I mean, it's, it's July in Alabama, and he had on a winter coat. So something's off somewhere, right? But I thought to myself, how many people are letting themselves be led away from God and from all of these wonderful things in eternity over stupid stuff, sexual sin, drugs, alcohol, hating someone, not forgiving someone. Um, don't, don't, let, don't let your flesh and the sinful nature of the flesh and the devil, and don't let anything rob you of spending eternity with Jesus and with each other. I mean, look, if I make it and you make it, we will, we will hang out. Amen. We will get, I can't wait to see my mom. You understand? We will get to have relationships without the demonic hindrance and the flesh hindrance. And we will get to have our families that make it. We'll get to be with them for all eternity. He's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death for us. There will be peace and joy and love, and the power and presence of God forever. Don't miss that for something stupid here. Amen? Amen. Happy Fourth of July weekend. (laughs) Our Independence Day is coming. The day Jesus returns will be the greatest independence day. We will be set free from the sinful flesh, from the corruptible body, from death, from Satan's power and influence, from the world that hates us and the sinners and the wicked people that hate us. We will be free! Amen? That's the only real freedom in Jesus. Don't miss out on that. Amen? Let's stand. I don't know, you got something back there, Chief? (laughs) I think we need to worship the King one more time. You will know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will make you free. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? The Word of God is truth. Nothing better. Nothing better. And I'm going to tell you, there's days. I have fun preaching this today. Fun. I have fun messing up people's theology and their world, rattling them, upsetting them. Hopefully they'll come out of their slumber and blindness. Let's pray and we'll, we'll worship with one more song here. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word, God, that you inspired and moved upon, breathed upon the apostles and prophets to write down your truth. And I don't care how many people reject it, blaspheme it, speak against it, make accusations against it. Lord, we have found it to be your truth. We know it is that you are. You are coming again. You are the creator, the only true God. You are the savior who died for our sins and rose from the dead. You are going to come back and make a new heavens and a new earth. You're going to bring justice and judgment. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you today. Help us to deal with any sin in our lives, any doubt, any unbelief, any unforgiveness. Help us cast it all out. Let the blood of Jesus wash it away and give us strength, Lord, to stand through the tribulation period as victorious soldiers of Jesus Christ. Pray it in Jesus' name.